Hi, everyone. Um, welcome to FAIR's webinar. My name is Carrie Mokowski. I am the National Program Senior Manager here at FAIR, and I am going to be your moderator for today's presentation, Biologic Drugs, Innovative Treatments to Target Food Allergies. So I'm so happy to have all of you here with us today, and I just wanted to give a little bit of housekeeping before we get started. Um, this presentation is going to be recorded, and we'll have it edited and ready to go for you guys in about two weeks. So it'll be posted on our FAIR uh, website soon. Um, please do note that for maintaining a quality recording, all attendees are going to be muted throughout the presentation. However, if you're having any kind of technical difficulties, you can use the questions or the chat features that you see in the GoToWebinar toolbar that's right on the right-hand side of your screen. So while we won't necessarily be stopping the presenter to ask questions throughout um, his webinar, we will have some time to answer a couple of moderated questions at the end. So throughout the presentation, if something comes to you, please feel free to, to chat us and type it. And if we don't get to it at the end, you know, we can always follow up after the presentation. Um, you can also join us um, online. You can follow us on Twitter at Food Allergy, um, and you can also share maybe some of your favorite moments um, of the webinar using hashtag FairWebinar. So please join us on social media if you can. Um, okay, so without further ado, I'd love to introduce today's presenter, um, Dr. Tom Casali. Um, Tom Casali is a professor of medicine at the University of South Florida and FAIR's chief medical advisor for operations. The former president of the American Academy of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology. Dr. Casali has participated in over 250 multi-site clinical trials and has been on advisory boards for the development of clinical trials for novel treatments. He has published over 400 scientific papers, reviews, and chapters on his research. Dr. Casali joined the University of South Florida in Tampa in October 2013 as Professor of Medicine and Pediatrics and Chief of Clinical and Translational Research. Prior to that, Dr. Casali was Professor of Medicine and Medical Microbiology and Immunology and Chief of Allergy Immunology at Creighton University in Omaha. He was executive vice president of the Quad AI for 10 years, was on the board of directors of the World Allergy Organization, and was chair of the American Board of Allergy and Immunology. He is a member of the American Thoracic Society and the American Society for Clinical Investigation, is a fellow of the American College of Physicians, and has received distinguished service awards from both Quad AI and the World Allergy Organization. So at this time, I am very delighted to turn the presentation over to Tom. Thanks, Carrie. It's a pleasure to uh, be here today to talk about what I think is a very exciting time for food allergy. And that is the development of several new therapies that will hopefully make a big difference for patients' lives with food allergy. So what I'm going to do is uh, we'll start off by just providing a little bit of background about what I'm going to talk about. And I have two major objectives. The first one is to provide an overview of the biology of allergic reactions. And I'm going to do this in a way that will hopefully allow you to understand why we're using certain drugs or certain biologics for the treatment of food allergy. What do they block? What do they do in order to make your food allergy symptoms better? And the second will be to talk about the therapeutic potential of biologics for food allergy. I'm not going to discuss anything that is what we call preclinical development, that is, I'm just going to describe actual treatments that are in clinical trials or uh, uh, perhaps approved for other indications, but make sense to try on food allergy. So let's first talk about why we need to do this. I think all of you with food allergy can 
appreciate that the current standard of care for flu allergy is just not adequate. You have to practice strict avoidance. And then if you have an accidental exposure, you have to manage those reactions quickly, typically with injectable epinephrine and antihistamines. Peter has supported a number of research initiatives to try and prevent the development of asthma and food allergy, and in particular, the LEAP study, which showed that early introduction of foods may develop, uh, may uh, cause people to change their immune system in a way that they don't develop food allergy. And some of those patients were actually blocked from the so-called atopic march. That is, from atopic dermatitis or eczema to food allergy to allergic rhinitis or hay fever and asthma. They all seem to link together. So if we can prevent that chain of events in someone's life, that would be a major step forward. So prevention is something that's really been important. But I'm going to focus today on investigational treatments. I'm not going to cover immunotherapy uh, in any detail. Rather, I'm going to talk about biologics. And I think, again, I want to do this because of the importance of trying to make the quality of life of patients with food allergy improve. Because we all know that the risk of accidental exposure is constant and widespread. For those of you that are parents or caregivers, you understand how difficult it is when you have a child with food allergy to send them to a birthday or other types of parties, or to even send them out to friends and family, or to go out with a friend where they might share a snack without an adult knowing. All of these things provide a very high level of anxiety for parents and caregivers. And of course, obviously, for patients with food allergy. The other problems we have is including that packaged foods, even though that they have labels with the eight primary allergens that are mostly responsible for food allergy reactions, Labels can be hard to understand, and risk can be mistakenly assigned based on precautionary allergen label. And then, of course, in school, that's a difficult area because substitute teachers may not know your child has a food allergy. Lunch rooms uh, tend to be a little bit trickier because that can be an issue if they're serving, for example, peanut-based products and your child is allergic to peanuts. So immunotherapy, as I said, we're not going to discuss that in detail, but I do want to make a couple of points. We now, as of uh, just a little bit ago, have one product approved for the treatment of peanut allergy, that is Pelforzia, which is a peanut-based pro-immunotherapy. And it's clearly shown that it's effective, but we know that it's fraught with potential side effects because just like with allergy immunotherapy for environmental things, ragweed, grass, trees, we're giving patients something that they're allergic to. So you're always at a risk of developing an allergic reaction to that. Also, there's some issues with practicality because you have to take it every day. And in certain people, there's an aversion to do that because if you're taking peanut product, some people have an aversion to that taste. They really do not like it, so it's difficult for them to eat. In any case, let me uh, walk you through some alternatives. And this is 
what we'd like to focus on today, and that is biologic therapies. So what are biologics? Biologics are products that are produced from living organisms or contain components of living organisms. These include a wide variety of products derived from humans, animals, or microorganisms. And by and large, they're all pretty much uh, used if they've been either humanized or made in a human. Because otherwise, you would develop an allergic reaction to them because they're considered to be foreign in nature when your immune system comes in contact with them. So let's look at what biologics are. They're genetically engineered proteins that target specific parts of the immune system that fuel inflammation. On the next slide, I want to show you that the agents that we're going to discuss today are called monoclonal antibodies. What's an antibody? An antibody is a protein that's made by your body as part of the host defense system to attack viruses, bacteria, any foreign invaders into the body. And there are many parts to this antibody. The part here is where the antigen binds. So if you're allergic to peanut, for example, the peanut would bind to this particular area of this antibody. These antibodies are very specific in that if you were to ingest a tree nut or sesame or something else, it's not going to bind to this antibody because it's very, very specific. And these are the types of things that are being made to attack areas of the immune system that we think are important in causing individuals to develop food allergies and have symptoms of food allergy. So some of the biologics that are being used right now for other disorders make sense to try for food allergy. And if you look at the top of this slide, you could see that the number one consideration is asthma. We now have five biologics, five monoclonal antibodies that are used in asthma. And all five of these are either being studied or considered for studying for the treatment of food allergy. And by the way, these are the generic names of them. And the generic names are very important because they tell you something about these monoclonal antibodies. So I'll pick on omalizumab, which you may know by Zolair, the trade name. If you look at the end, it says MAB. That means it's a monoclonal antibody. And then you see here, there's a ZU, and that means it's humanized. So in the case of omalizumab, it was actually made in a mouse, but then parts of that mouse antibody were taken out and human pieces were put in, so you wouldn't develop an allergic reaction to it. The LI is specific for any monoclonal antibody that's considered to block immune pathways or immunomodulators. And the OMA was just developed by the company. So the only difference in a lot of these, if you look at Pilimab, it only has a U here because it's fully human. It was made in humans. But again, it's immunomodulating, it's a monoclonal antibody, and the name is Duke that was given to it by the company that developed it. Atopic dermatitis or eczema, dupilumab is approved for. Chronic rhinositis with nasal polyps, dupilumab's approved. Chronic spontaneous urticaria, omalizumab is approved for it. And this vasculitis with a long name, mepolizumab is approved for. 
And again, all of these are now being tried for food allergy. But right now, they're also being tried for other allergic type diseases or respiratory diseases. And I've listed them here like COPD, allergic rhinitis, and other disorders, including eosinophilic esophagitis. Now, this is a little bit of a complex slide, but it's important to walk you through it so you know why we're using these monoclonal antibodies. How do you become allergic to something? And in this case, I'm using peanut as an example. First off, you have to have the genetic predisposition to develop an allergy. So what happens once you have that genetic predisposition and you're first exposed to that peanut, it's taken up by what we call an antigen presenting cell and it's presented to a T cell. This T cell then produces certain signals called cytokines and it produces a number of these. But the most important ones for our uh, topic today are IL-4 and IL-13 because they cause another type of immune cell called a B cell to switch from making one type of antibody, in this case IgM, to making IgE. IgE is what makes you allergic. It is the antibody responsible for allergic reactions. Once you make this IgE, what happens is it binds to cells called mast cells, and these are the cells that typically induce the allergic reaction. So when this peanut is entered into the body for a second time, this mast cell that's armed with this IgE can bind that peanut and ultimately that cross-linking of two IgE antibodies causes the mast cell to release a number of different mediators. And the most famous of which you've heard of would probably be histamine. And that's why people with allergic reactions take antihistamines, drug to counteract the effects of histamine. But this cell produces a number of other mediators. And when it's produced in a large uh, quantity, one could develop anaphylaxis or severe allergic reactions. So just looking at the scheme, you could envision that if you had a monoclonal antibody or a biologic that would address either IgE or the production of IgE, then you might have a winner in regards to treating allergies and in particular food allergy. Dupilumab blocks the effects of IL-4 and IL-13. Omalizumab blocks IgE, and that's why these drugs are in clinical trials for food allergy. Now, as I said, this mast cell is key for the development of an acute allergic reaction to foods. And it produces so many different chemicals and mediators like histamine and uh, heparin and lipid mediators like leukotrienes and other cytokines that ultimately cause these initial symptoms. So if you have an acute allergic reaction, you start producing mucus, you get swelling, your airways close off, bronchoconstriction, you get abdominal pain. And in the worst case scenarios, you drop your blood pressure and have cardiovascular effects. So what we've learned is that we could control some of these symptoms by blocking a few of these mediators. So yes, antihistamines help a little bit, but ultimately you have to shut this cell down in order to really make a difference. Well, how do you shut that cell down? When you use epinephrine, 
it helps to shut down the release of further mediators and it counteracts a number of these things like edema, bronchoconstriction, abdominal pain, and the hypotension associated with acute allergic reactions. That's why you use epinephrine. So now let's talk a little bit uh, about the specific biologics that are being developed for the therapy of food allergy. And I'm gonna look at this slide for just one second, but again, remind you that there's a couple of steps in this allergic reaction that we could intervene with biologics that might be important for inhibiting that mast cell release and inhibiting the development of a food allergy attack. First off, if you have uh, the release of what we call alarmins, why are they called alarmins? Because they're sort of one of your first defense systems. When you're exposed to an allergen, a bacteria, or anything, it first has to cross the initial cell layer. In the case of food allergy, that would be the intestine, the, the epithelial layer. And when it's attacked, it produces these cytokines. These are very important for helping for the development of these antigen presenting cells and Th2 cells that we just talked about, which then produce IL-4 and IL-13, important for the development of a B cell producing IgE, which arms mast cells. So we'll come back to this, but because we know this biology, attempts are now being used to block IL-33 this TSLP, IL-4, IL-13, and IgE. So on the next slide, you could see the biologic clinical trials either ongoing or planned. The first one is that omalizumab has been around for a number of years, and it is being looked at either alone, that is, without anything else for the treatment of food allergy or is used in conjunction with oral immunotherapy. And there's a number of studies that I'll briefly go over that look at that. Dupilumab was the drug that blocks IL-4 and IL-13, important for the production of IgE, is also being looked at alone or as an adjunct to oral immunotherapy. And one study is even adding omalizumab on top of that. Now we talked about these alarmins. So I'll show you a study where they tried anti-IL-33. And I'll show you uh, that this drug appears to work in the initial study. What are some other targets? Well, we talked about TSLP as another alarmant, and it turns out that for IL-33 to work, it has to bind to a receptor on a cell, and that receptor is ST2, so that if you block this, the effects of IL-13 never occur. And we also know that there are other molecules like IL-5, important for other types of inflammatory cells to get into the gut that could be uh, important for the development of food allergy and perhaps blocking that will make a difference. And there are DNA vaccines and novel allergen immunotherapy strategies that are also being tried. So let's briefly go over some of the results of some of these trials. Omalizumab which is an anti-IgE monoclonal antibody. As we said, we know that IgE is very important. Think of omalizumab as an anti-IgE monoclonal antibody as a sponge, if you would. It's in the blood and it sucks up all the IgE that you're making so that that mast cell doesn't have any IgE on it 
So this way, when you're exposed to a peanut, for example, there's nothing here that would be able to cause the mast cell to release mediators. And that's a key way that anti-IgE antibodies would work. And I say antibodies because there are several new ones that block IgE that are under development for other disorders that will probably be tried for food allergy as well. Now, the proof of concept that this would actually work was actually done in a study that was published in New England Journal of Medicine in 2003, where they took the investigators, uh, Don Leon, Yu Samson, and other people, took an antibody to IgE. In this case, it was TNX901, which was sort of a precursor for omalizumab. And they gave it to individuals, and you could see that the placebo group were reactive to just under a half a peanut. And throughout the study, they changed their sensitivity just a little bit, but not much. However, when they were treated with a monoclonal antibody, in this case, either at 150 or 300 milligrams, you could see that the threshold that is the amount that individuals could tolerate went up. And at the highest dose, it went up to almost nine peanuts. So remember that they started out sensitive as a group to about a half a peanut where they would get a reaction. And then it went up to nine peanuts. It's important to remember though that 25% of patients were no better but 25% could ingest up to eight grams, which is a lot of peanuts, and that would probably allow you to even eat a peanut butter sandwich. So omalizumab as a monotherapy has been studied by a number of individuals. The first study published in 2011 was a very small study involving 14 peanut allergic patients, and five of these were on placebo or inactive drug, with only nine getting the active drug. Unfortunately, the study was stopped early because in order to qualify to get into the study, patients had to have an acute allergic reaction to the peanut. Well, two of those reactions were very severe, so it was stopped. Nonetheless, they had some promising indications that it might work. Subsequently, there were other studies done by investigators, and you can look that they're mostly small studies, 14, 23, or in this case, 15 patients, but in the case of this, multiple food allergic patients that were treated, and every one of them showed a treatment effect. That is, patients were able to tolerate more of the food they were allergic to. And on this slide, I'll just give you an example. This is a study by Savage. Here you could see that their sensitivity at the start of the study was at about a fourth of a peanut, but after treatment with omalizumab, that went up quite dramatically to 6,500, which is almost 22 peanuts, and it remained at that level throughout the study. This is an interesting study just published last year where they actually looked at patients with severe asthma because omalizumab has an indication for severe asthma. And they took 15 people that were allergic to two or more foods and looked to see whether or not they got better to their food allergy when they were being treated with omalizumab actually for the asthma. And you could see that they had a variety of different allergens here. So what did the study show? Here you could see the sensitivity before they started to wheat, only three patients, but markedly increased. 
to egg, markedly increased to milk, and to baked milk. Now, the importance of doing something like this is that it shows that, as we would predict, omelismab should work regardless of what you're allergic to, right? Because it takes out the antibody important for allergy. It doesn't care whether that antibody is specific for egg, for peanut, for baked milk, whatever. And that's what they showed in this small study. So now what people are also doing is looking at omelizumab as a pretreatment before you start oral immunotherapy and then looking to see what happens. And you can see that there's been several studies with this. And I'm not going to read through the slide. Again, these slides will be available to you later. But basically, what it shows is that if you pretreat somebody with omelizumab, you protect them from allergic reactions to the oral immunotherapy, and you enhance the effect of the oral immunotherapy slightly. On this slide, I'll show you one of the studies published last year. Here you can see patients underwent a food challenge. Then they were placed on omelizumab for 16 weeks. And then they received oral immunotherapy for two to five week, uh, foods during weeks eight through 30, which means that for part of the time, the omelizumab was gone and the patients were just placed on the oral immunotherapy. At the end of that treatment, patients were either maintained on oral immunotherapy at one of two doses or they were stopped. And then patients were looked at to see what happened. Because there was no difference in the 1,000 and the 300 milligram dose of the food, these two are combined as shown on the next slide. So the number of patients passing more than two oral food challenges to two grams of a protein was 34 out of 40 in the active treatment group and 11 out of 20 in the active treatment group that had their oral immunotherapy stopped six weeks before. This is an important point that we're learning with oral immunotherapy, that it appears that you have to continue that oral immunotherapy, perhaps for uh, an indefinite period of time. Secondary endpoints, you could see again, more people were able to pass more than three, more than four, or more than five oral food challenges to different foods under the cover of omelizumab initially. So clinical evidence for the use of omelizumab, I think you could appreciate that. It could be used either as a monotherapy or in conjunction with oral immunotherapy, but we need a lot more information about how best to do these types of studies so patients can be protected. And that's where this study, the OUTMATCH study, comes in. This is a big NIH trial that uh, is beginning shortly, which has three stages. One is omelizumab monotherapy compared to no treatment. The second is omelizumab plus oral immunotherapy, and the third is continued omelizumab without immunotherapy. So if you look at this, again, the first stage will let you know how protective omelizumab is with these double-blind food challenges, and the second stage will let us know whether or not omelizumab by itself is as effective or more effective than oral immunotherapy in conjunction with omelizumab.
So this will be a very important study to help us inform where we should go with this. Unfortunately, we won't get the results for about another three years. So hang in there, we'll see what happens. Now going back to this diagram, as I indicated, we have these alarmins and one that's been studied in a study just published by the Stanford group showed the effects of blocking IL-33 in a peanut allergy population. So what they did is they did a screening to make sure patients had food allergy to peanut. They put them on this monoclonal antibody to, uh, to IL-33, and then they did challenges down the line to see if they were protected. So what did they find? Here you can see that uh, at baseline, of course, nobody was able to pass a food challenge with the equivalent of one peanut. But after 15 days, that is a single injection of that monoclonal antibody, 11 of 15 of the active group passed that. And at day 45, 57% of patients were able to tolerate that. So that is an indication that this drug might in fact work for patients with food allergy. Here is the individual data, but what you could also see is that four of these patients did not respond. So we still need more information about this, but it's encouraging that this might be another tack to try using a biologic. And then dupilumab, remember dupilumab is that monoclonal antibody that affects both IL-4 and IL-13, which is important for the development of IgE. They are doing two studies, both of which are ongoing. One is to see how it works by itself. And the second is to see how it works in conjunction with AR101, that is Helforcia, or the peanut oral immunotherapy product. So both of these tri uh, trials are ongoing now. I think the enrollment for this one just finished, but the one using dupilumab as monotherapy is still ongoing. So my take on the current treatment strategies right now is that the data for omalizumab looks pretty strong and it's safe and it's practical because you get an injection every two to four weeks. The oral immunotherapy for Pelforsia shows good efficacy, uh, but you do have some allergic reactions to it and you have to take it every day, which makes it a little less practical. Viaskin or Epid is the peanut patch. It doesn't appear to be quite as effective as Pelforsia, but it's got a better safety profile. And again, you have to put the patch on every day. There's some interesting data to suggest that sublingual, that is putting peanut under your tongue, works better than doing it orally, but it was a small study. And then dupilumab, we don't have enough efficacy data to be really confident as a monotherapy. Nonetheless, it appears to be safe. And this could be self-administered at home every two weeks. There are other biologics in clinical trials. There's one that's uh, from Hal Pharmaceuticals, that's a subcutaneous injection of what you're allergic to, but they use fragments of that protein, so you're less likely to develop an allergic reaction. We talked about these antibodies to IL-33, TSLP. There are vaccines that are being developed. And we know that the microbiome is important, so there are companies either looking at specific bacteria or even a fecal transplant to help change that uh, microbiome, so you might not be allergic. And there are other things, including intralymphatic immunotherapy, that is, they inject the immunotherapy into a lymph node, which provides 
greater protection. So lots of things happening. And I think that's exciting. And I wanted to illustrate that further because remember I said that the mast cell is key and there are other inflammatory cells like eosinophils that could be important. And of course, it's the B cell that helps make the IgE, the T cell that sends its signals. Look at all the drugs that are out here that are being used to attack many of these important pathways. All of these could potentially play a role for the treatment of food allergies. And what we're trying to do at FAIR is to convince people that are manufacturing these drugs that they could play a role. They could shut off mast cell degranulation. They could shut off the production of IgE. They could keep inflammatory cells from coming into the target organs that cause allergic reactions. So I think this is a very exciting time. And if you look at the approaches to food allergy, we could divide them up into two broad categories. One would be antigen dependent. That is, we're giving you something that is specific for what you're allergic to, like peanut oral immunotherapy or peanut patch. The second is non-antigen dependent. So we block IgE. We shut off the mast cell. We restore the microbiome. Different ways of doing this. This type of approach might be more practical for somebody that has more than one food allergy. And this is just a chart showing you that the phase three studies are finished for Bioskin and of course Palforzia was just approved. But there are other agents with immunotherapy platforms that are being looked at and hopefully will come to the clinic in the next several years. But I want to stop with a couple of points for consideration. We have to ask, will a biologic prevent that accidental exposure? So for example, if you're allergic to peanut, and we can block the accidental exposure to 300 to 600 milligrams of protein, equivalent to one or two peanuts, we would prevent about 90 to 95% of those cross-contamination uh, anaphylactic reactions that occur. Will a biologic allow you to eat the food you're allergic to? So if I treat you, it's nice if I could do number one, but suppose I like peanut butter, or if you're allergic to shrimp, maybe you'd like to eat shrimp. We don't know yet. Will a biologic change the immune system so you could achieve tolerance off therapy? What does that mean? What that means is that can I stop the treatment after a defined period of time so you're no longer sensitive to what I treated you for. We don't know yet. Currently, at least for asthma, it looks like if you use these biologics, we're not able to get you off of them. The fourth bullet point is important because it shows that with an estimated 32 million food allergy patients in the US, and an average cost of these biologics of 20 to 50,000 per year, that would cost the healthcare system $1 trillion per year if we treated everybody. So the bottom line is that there's a lot of questions that we have to address, but there's hope. There's a lot of hope we have to do a better job at developing biologic-like drugs that are effective and cheaper so that everybody could have access to them. And before I leave you, I want to just remind you that FAIR has a patient registry and encourage you to sign up for it because this is how we get information about food allergies so that we can help you fight 
the problems associated with food allergy, whether it's psychosocial issues, anxiety, or helping direct you towards a clinical trial that might uh, ultimately provide some relief for your symptoms. So I'm going to stop there and uh, answer any questions. Wonderful, thank you, Tom. Um, it is such such exciting stuff, and really, you know, giving us hope for for a better future. So thank you for all of that information. And we did actually get a couple of questions come through um, while you were delivering your presentation, and one kind of on the heels of just talking about patient registry and what that can mean. Um, some attendees wanted to know, is there anything that they can do that would help encourage more clinical trials just, you know, in the realm of food allergies? Any advice you can give them or actions they can take? Absolutely. So I think the biggest thing is that uh, we need more federal money for doing research on food allergy. That is to replace that double-blind placebo-controlled food challenge, which I know is not pleasant at all to patients, and it will facilitate drug delivery and also do <laughs> studies where we can take on uh, new trials. Yeah. So uh, advocate for this for, our, for your Congress people. Great, thank you. Um, so I had some questions ready, but a few are just rolling in and they kind of are asking some of the same topics and that is about possible negative side effects for biologics or these treatments, um, which is probably always the case. But can you talk about, you know, any of perhaps some of the negative long-term side effects that sure. could be involved? Thanks. Anytime you mess with the immune system, you have to be careful because we don't want to cure the disease we're treating, but put you at risk for developing another disease where that immune pathway that we block is important in preventing as well. Thus far, the molecules that have been targeted uh, have not shown any severe adverse effects. So those biologics that are already approved for asthma have a good safety profile. The biologics that are approved for atopic dermatitis or eczema have a good safety profile. I know people are wondering. But we'll have to Wonder see what happens with some of these other ones, like blocking these alarmants. Wonderful. Thank you. And just a couple more questions. I know a lot are coming in. And what we'll do, for those of you still on the call, is we'll kind of look all, through all of these questions and work with Dr. Casali to kind of put together you know, a resource for you that we'll post online. Um, so don't worry if we don't get to your question, but just I know probably a lot of our attendees and listeners are, are thinking about maybe the age of their child. And, you know, is there any data that's showing kind of the efficacy of, of the biologics pre or post puberty? Or is there anything, um, you know, with the child's age that comes into play when people are thinking about treatment options? Yes, uh, obviously, uh, these drugs tend to get developed first for 12 and above or 18 and above. All the biologics for asthma, there's only two of them, mepolizumab and omelizumab or Zolaire, that are approved down to six years of age for children with asthma, and they've been shown to be safe. The atopic dermatitis drug, Dupilumab, that's being tried for food allergy, also appears to be safe in that age range for children. And these newer uh, clinical trials that I discussed will actually be going down to much younger ages, uh, perhaps down to two or younger, because we feel that the earlier this we start, probably the better chance we have of either preventing the development of another food allergy or perhaps the development of things like asthma. Wonderful, thank you. Um, just hopefully a quick one. Um, are biologics always administered via shot? Are you aware of any ingestion options that happen to be in the works? Uh, currently, they're all uh, given by injections, but 
there is a company in Europe that's working on an anti-IgE antibody uh, like Solar that can be taken uh, orally. So we'll see whether or not uh, that is successful. There's another one that's looking at whether uh, you could take it by inhalation. Wonderful, thank you. Um, again, I just want to say thank you to all of our attendees for joining us and being so engaged. Um, Dr. Castelli, so many questions have come through, and again, we will work together to get answers to those and, and get them posted online. Um, it's such a fascinating and exciting topic, and I'm so glad, um, Dr. Casali, that you could join us today and you know talk about it. I think there'll be much more discussion about it in the future as things move forward. So again, thank you to everyone for joining us, and thank you, Tom, for your time. My pleasure, and I hope uh, you can see the light at the end of the tunnel. We're finally making progress allergy. Agreed. Wonderful. Thanks all. Bye-bye.